All right. Today we're going to focus on calculations involving limiting reactants. Now, to be able to understand the, the calculations, it's important that we can relate this to something in our everyday life, so to make it easier for us to understand the topic. So, let's look at this example. I send you into the kitchen and I tell you to go bake me biscuits. And I give you a certain amount of ingredients and I, I ask you, how many of these batches of biscuits will you make? Well, importantly, you need to know how, how many ingredients you will need to make one batch of biscuits. So if you look at the information, it says for one batch of cookies, you're going to require two cups of flour, three cups, oh sorry, three eggs, and one cup of sugar. So to do this, you need to be able to go and say, well, okay, let's look at the ingredients and then see how many batches can each ingredient give me. So if I look at my flour, I require two cups of flour and I have seven. So 7 divided by 2 means I can make maximum 3 batches. Then I will have a, a cup left over. So the one cup left over might confuse you. Well, hang on, I can make more than 3 batches. No, you can't. You can only make exactly 3 batches. So the maximum amount of batches that we can do for the, with the flour that we have is we can make 3 batches. So now we're going to look at the eggs. We say, okay, I have 6 eggs. I need 3 eggs for one batch. So... 6 divided by 3 gives me 2. I can make maximum 2 batches of biscuits with the eggs that I have. <coughs> with the sugar, um, I only need 1 cup. And if I have 6 cups, I can make 6 batches of biscuits. From this, we can clearly see that while I'm baking, I'm going to run out of um, I'm going to run out of eggs after the second batch. I'll be able to do the second batch, and after the second batch, I'm going to have no more eggs. So I'll have to stop baking biscuits, unless I go to the shop and get some more some more eggs. But with what I have, I cannot make more than two batches. So the maximum amount of batches of biscuits that I will get from my reactants that I have here is two. So these are my reactants, this is my product. That means the one that is used up first, the eggs, this one over here, this one we refer to as a limiting reactant. So a limiting reactant is the reactant that is used up first in a chemical reaction. When that reactant is used up, no more product can be formed. So the reaction will then stop. I will have eggs, I will have, sorry, flour and sugar left over. Those are called my excess reactants. From this, I can clearly go and work out how much is it going to be in excess. So I have seven cups of flour. I use um, two cups per batch of biscuits. I'm going to make two batches, so two times two gives me four. So I'm going to use four cups of flour, and I have seven. So seven minus the four that I've used means I will have three cups in excess. So this is my excess reactant. And I will have three cups in excess. So from the values, I can even work out how much I will have left over. Because this is going to be left over excess reactant. Same with the sugar. I'm only going to use six, um, two cups of the six. So if I take away the two cups that I use, I will have four cups in excess. So the sugar and the flour is my excess reactant, and then the eggs is my limiting reactant. So the eggs is the one that determines how many batches of biscuits and am, am I going to make. It's also the one that determines how much is going to be left over of the ones that are in excess because when I used up the eggs my reaction is going to stop. Right now let's bring this back to real life chemistry now because now we've looked at it as a simple everyday example but let's put it back to chemistry. So if I look at this chemical reaction Whenever I do these calculations, the first thing that I'm going to need is I'm going to need a balanced chemical equation. When you read this question, I'm telling you what's happening. So you need to understand the relationships, and we've done that already. So I'm telling you that potassium chloride reacts with oxygen, and I'm telling you that it forms potassium chloride. Obviously, this is not a balanced chemical equation. I still have to balance this chemical equation. So, I go and I start counting my particles. Now, everybody have different methods. When it's a simple equation like this, I can do it in my head. 
When it becomes more complicated, I write my elements out. So for this one, I'll just look at my particles, and I will always do oxygen and hydrogen first. So in this case, I don't have hydrogens. Two oxygens on the left and three on the right. When I see the numbers two and three, the first thing I think of is six. So I can make the oxygen a six by putting a three in front of oxygen. So when you balance, you can't change the formula. You can't come and write numbers here in between. You can't change these formulas. They are, they are fixed but you put big numbers in front, we call them coefficients. I can easily turn this into 6 if I put a 2 in front of potassium chlorate. But now this 2 is applicable to everything behind it. So now I've also changed the potassiums. So let's start from the beginning. On this side I have 1 potassium and now I have 2 on this side. So I can fix that by putting a 2 in front of potassium chloride. So if I put the 2 there, now I have 2 potassiums on the left and 2 on the right. I have two chlorines on the left, and look, automatically, this fixed the chlorine problem to two on the right. I have six oxygens on the left and six on the right. Now that I know the ratio that these elements are standing in, it's possible for me to calculate anything. Now remember, if you want to know the mass of potassium chloride, you will take these particles, add them together, and then multiply them by two, because you know that there's two mole, and that will give you the mass. So when you know how many moles you have, you can calculate the mass. So what we're going to do is, we're going to take the mass. Now we've been given the masses of these particles. We've been told that you're going to walk into the lab and I'm going to give you 50 grams of potassium chloride and I'm going to give you 50 grams of oxygen. So it's the same as sending you into the kitchen and telling you to bake the biscuits. So I need to go look at which one of these are going to be used up first. So that means I need to find out which one am I going to be too much or which one's going to be too little, right? So the easiest way to do this is to compare these two elements with each other in a chemical reaction. So I'm going to start off, I'm going to start off with this one and I'm going to compare it with that one to see if I have 50 grams of potassium chloride, how much oxygen will I actually need? Then I'll be able to see, will the 50 grams be too much, or is it going to be too little, right? So, let's start the, the calculation. We write down exactly what we have. We have 50 grams of potassium chloride. That's how much we have. Now, I need to know how many moles of potassium chloride that is. So, I have 50 grams of potassium chloride, and I need to know how many moles of potassium chloride is this? Because when I know how many moles of this I have, I can find out how many moles of this one I will need because they're in a ratio of 2 is to 3. So I will have to find out if I have so many moles of potassium chloride, how many mole of oxygen am I going to need? And once I know how many moles of oxygen I have, I will be able to convert that and say, well, how many grams of oxygen will I, will I ha um, need? Okay, so now it's easy for me to write my factors in because I can see that I need to have grams of potassium chloride at the bottom here. I need to have mole because there's mole of potassium chloride there. I need to have mole of potassium chloride at the bottom here. And because I have mole of oxygen there, I need to have mole of oxygen at the bottom here. Now it's easy for me to carry on with my calculation. So, to do this calculation, I will need to get the molar masses. So, balance equation I have, but I don't have the molar masses. So, I would have to go and calculate the molar masses of potassium chloride and oxygen for this calculation. I'm going to need that. But eventually, I will need this one as well. So the best is when you start this to actually work out the molar mass of the potassium chloride and to work out the molar mass of oxygen, the molar mass of potassium chloride. Now, molar masses means I'm not worried about these coefficients in front. I just want to know what is the molar mass of KCl. So what I will do is I will calculate the molar mass of the ingredients that I have, potassium chloride, 
and the molar mass of oxygen. These are the two substances that I put into it. Then I will calculate the molar mass of potassium chloride, my product. So to get the molar mass of potassium chloride, now I just look at my, 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 um, my reactants. I'm not worried about my equation. So to get the molar mass of potassium chloride, we are going to take 39.1, which is the relative atomic mass for potassium, and add it to 35.5. And that gives me 74.6 grams per mole. I will do the same for oxygen. So how many oxygens do I have? Two. So that means two times 16, and that gives me 32 grams per mole. I will do the same for this one, potassium chlorate. So that's going to be 39.1 for potassium, plus there's one chlorine, 35.5, plus 3 times 16. So if I calculate that answer, I see that I'm going to get 122.6 grams per mole. Grams per mole? because this is all, these all represent one mole. The, the, the formula for every substance represents one mole. So when I do molar mass, I just want to look at the formula for the substances. I'm not worried about how it's balanced in the equation. I don't need those coefficients for my molar mass. So the best is to write them down and write them out so that you do not get confused with it. I found that many of the girls are getting confused. You don't know when you have to look at mass and you don't know when you have to look at molar mass. When do you use the two and the three in front when not? So for this, you just write out the reactants and your product and you work out their molar masses. Now I'm ready to do my calculation. So to find out how many moles of potassium chloride I have, I will use the molar mass of potassium chloride. So when I look at the molar mass of potassium chloride, I see one mole is 74.6 grams. So that means I will put it in here that one mole is 74.6 grams. If I want to find out how many moles of oxygen I'm going to use, I will use my mole ratio because I know that for every two moles of potassium chloride, I need three moles. So I want to know how many moles of oxygen is needed for the number of moles that I have. <coughs> Sorry. The number of moles that I have in 50 grams. So I will use these mole ratios. How many moles of oxygen do I have? I have three moles. That means I will put the three in front here for oxygen. How many moles of potassium chloride do I have? I have two, so I will put the two there because I can see that's where potassium chloride must be. So it's very important that this was written down, so it's easy for me to put it in the right place. Now to change from the number of moles of oxygen to the mol mass of oxygen, I will go use my molar mass of oxygen, which is 32 grams per mole. So that means one mole is 32 grams. If I take all of these and I put it into my calculator using my fraction button, it's going to tell me that I will need 32.17 grams of oxygen for this chemical reaction. Now, I've been given 50 grams, so guess what? Because I've been given 50 grams, I have too much oxygen, right? I will not use up the 50 grams that I've been given. I will only use a part of that. So that already tells me that in this chemical reaction, the oxygen is going to be my excess reactant. So oxygen is my excess reactant and potassium chloride is my limiting reactant. And the maximum amount of potassium chloride that I will be able to produce here is going to be, I, I'll have to calculate that. And to do that, I will use my limiting reactant. And that will be in my next video.